church this morning. My name is Miles, if you're new. Uh, Bonnie and I get the privilege of serving this location and pastoring, and we are full of faith and, and vision for our future as uh, we set the sails for all that God has for us and our church and impacting our city, our nation, the world, and we serve a big God uh, who can do whatever he wants. And uh, I'm challenged always as a leader to think bigger, to dream bigger, uh, to, to be obedient to the call of God that's on our life as a church, and I'm excited for our great future. Before I jump into God's Word today, I do want to give a little update as we worship God with our tithes and offerings, with our giving. I like giving updates. do this about once a quarter. End of July uh, 30th, here is our uh, budget to actual on our giving. Good news is we're right on track and we celebrate uh, that we are right on track with our giving. Uh, the orange line is called the budget. Who knows the budget has been uh, devastated of late with a thing called inflation. And so you probably have felt that. Uh, we have felt that at, as well as our church, as our um, building costs have, have increased. And so right on track, but we're a little bit behind because of that inflation component. But no doubt, uh, God is with us and we keep praying and, and believing. And thank you for your generosity and thank you for your giving. I also want to give an update on legacy. What's legacy if you knew? Well, legacy is when we give a, a, an offering over and above our normal giving. It's a one-time offering that we pledge over the year. And so this year, at the end of uh, June 30th, we had a pledge amount of $213,000, a massive uh, legacy. We can celebrate that. that. That's awesome. And so far, those pledges over the year have come in $114,000. Most of this goes to our missions. Okay, so that's outside of our church. Because our tithes and offerings, the other giving, uh, that goes to the operations budget, which is about a third is our buildings, a third is wages, uh, and a third is our ministries, kids' ministry, youth ministry, young adult, uh, creative, uh, pastoral care, all those. But this is actually uh, fuels us to hit the city, uh, the nation, the world to make an impact for the kingdom of God. And I want to thank you all for your giving. This little girl... Um, is uh, a little girl in a town north of Kiev in Ukraine. And last month, or actually it was in June, we gave $20,000 to an INC church in uh, Kiev, Ukraine, who goes out daily with this food program. The loaf of bread she's holding there is because of your giving. We fund this ministry in Ukraine. And I just feel... That is such an honor, such a privilege that we can give financially to impact a little girl, families who are devastated in a war-torn country. We can't even fathom. I'm in regular contact with the pastor. Uh, people are getting saved. Um, we're able to, to feed people humanitarily with the needs, and that's all because of, uh, of your generosity. So let me pray. Father, I praise God for our church, how we can be used by you to bring glory, number one, to your name, but also make a difference in the lives of people. Um, we, we just have our church with open hands. We, we, we trust you and, and, and guide and direct us and you use us for your glory. Um, we pray in Jesus' name. Our best way to give is on our website. You can actually see when you go to our website, you click the Gold Coast location, there's the tithes and offerings giving, or there's legacy. If you want to continue to give the legacy, um, you can do that. All right, let's jump into God's Word today. If you have your Bibles, uh, we're actually going to be sort of centered around a story found in Luke 15. We're starting a new series, and I've just been really stirred uh, about this series, and I'll start with a story to sort of unpack why we're doing it. Uh, my little daughter, yeah, she's grown up now, but when she was little and went to school, she sat on the front row. And it was probably grade one or grade two, she's on the front row. And I'm like, yeah, every parent, right? Once they get on the front row, she's going to be smart, you know, she's, she's going to have favor, she'll be a teacher's pet, she's going to go to uni, you know, she's going to be a doctor or a lawyer. She, she, she's, oh, this is all. So I was never on the front row, man. I was lucky to get into school at the back row because I was in trouble on the front row. So anyway, we were so excited that she was on the front row and leaning in. Well, turns out the reason she was on the front row was she could hardly see. She, she, she couldn't see it. She's really blind as a bat. The poor kid 
it took us years actually to find this out as parents. Poor parenting, just get your kids checked with their eyesight. And so, we, you know, that's why she was on the front row. I wonder how many of us today, when we see God, our view might be distorted. I wonder if we don't see clearly who God is based on some impediment that we have with our sight. Now, not our physical sight, but our knowledge. Whether that's been a lack of knowledge or wrong knowledge, but so often our view of God is flawed. Now, if our view of God is flawed, that's a problem. A.W. Tozer says it this way, what comes into our minds when we think about uh, God is the most important thing about us. This is a big issue because it creates our identity. Yeah. And it really determines what we end up doing in this life. Who are we? Yeah. <laughs> well, whose are we? Well, why are we on this earth? What's, what's our purpose? What's the point? And so this series, I pray you'll come for all four weeks as we unpack our identity must be founded on Scripture. And Jesus came to reveal our God so that we could have a clearer picture. What comes to your mind when you hear that God is Father? What comes to your mind when you think of that word Father? If your view of God is flawed, our, our whole life will be flawed. And there's a good chance that our view of this world, Father, is in some way flawed because it's often based on an earthly father who's flawed. He's, he's human. <laughs> All humans are flawed. And so no wonder we might have this distorted view of God because we've had an earthly experience uh, that is flawed. Isaiah 64, 8, yet, O Lord, you are our what? You're our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. What's interesting is a potter cannot disown the pot. A potter, whether it's good or bad, he created the pot. And the pot is there in existence because of the potter. You are in existence because there is a creator. You didn't just show up because of a big bang or some gases or evolves from apes. You, there is a creator who has made you. And your identity has to be based that you have a spiritual father. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 9, This then is how you should pray, our, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus gives us more than salvation. He gives us a relationship with God the father. It's so much more than just salvation. It's about knowing you have a heavenly Father who wants a relationship with you. So Jesus shows up, his whole purpose, not just to save mankind, but to reveal who God is. So Jesus came to correct our flawed view of this word Father. In fact, John 14, 9 says, anyone who sees me, Jesus says, sees who? He sees the Father. The sun radiates God's own glory, Hebrews 1.3, and expresses the very what? The very character of God. Jesus came to, to show the character of God, his teachings, his lifestyle, was to help correct our wrong view of a father and give us the right view of a father by what he taught and, and, and what he did. Jesus said one thing more than any other in the Gospels, 189 times, that's a lot, this word was used, the word Father. Now, well, there's no evidence of any other person using this word Father pre-Christ. And so Jesus came to help us understand that He is Father. So today, we're going to dig into God's Word and, and, and look past our experiences, past our earthly dads, and we're going to learn what Jesus says about our Heavenly Father. And I really believe this will be life-changing. Um, I believe this has been a journey for me to understand who I am, my identity. It's something that doesn't happen overnight. But it's part of this whole sanctification. And when we accept Christ, we can actually be reshaped into His image. And it starts with this understanding. 
understanding who God is. Now, here's the problem. There are some earthly dads um, who have given us a distorted view of our heavenly dad. We just own it because we're, we're earthly. And so I want to contrast some of our earthly dad's flaws <laughs> with our heavenly dad's perfection. Because Jesus just didn't come to perfect our earthly dads. Jesus came to reveal the perfection of fatherhood, yeah. which is our heavenly father. So often we may have experienced an absent earthly father. Uh, absent, but wasn't present. Maybe death or divorce, maybe disinterest, or maybe abandonment, but your earthly dad was absent. But here's what the Bible says about our Lord, our God. He's omnipresent. In Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you, nor abandon you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Uh, our God is not absent. He, he's, he's present. He, he's watching. He's seeking. Actually, the Bible says he's interceding. So, so often, you know, we know this absence of our earthly dad, but the God is the opposite. He's engaged. He's caring. He's loving. He's wonderful. He's pure. He's holy. He's madly in love with you. Number one, we've got to change that viewpoint. Number two is often we had an abusive dad, an earthly dad. Whether it's emotional or physical, uh, they would use their strength against you, whether intentionally or, or unintentionally, but often we were hurt or injured. What does the Bible say about our heavenly dad? In Psalms 145, 17, the Lord is righteous in everything he does and he's filled with what? He's filled with kindness. He is a kind, a good, a loving God. He's not abusive. He, he, he wants to help us, not hurt us. And sometimes we have an earthly dad who's performance-based. And when you have to earn his favor, his love is based on your doing. Uh, you get good grades, you win at sports, he's happy. But our heavenly Father's love is not based on our doing, it's based on who we are, our being. We are sons and daughters of God. In fact, Ephesians 4 says you're saved by grace. Um, you, you know, being saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It, it is the gift of God. We're not saved by works so no man can boast. God loves us for who we are. Uh, he, he loved us first. He, he first stepped into our lives before we even knew. Uh, he is a God of grace, uh, a, a God of mercy. It's not by our works. It's not performance-based. Just because we breathe, uh, we can receive his love and his grace. Some dads are passive. They're in the room, but they're not in your life. They're, they're, they're kind of hiding instead of correcting, or they're silent instead of speaking up or speaking into your world. And often it's insecurities from these earthly dads, or they want to please uh, these earthly dads that prevent them from loving you or correcting you. Romans 8.28 says, and, and know that all things work together for good for those who love God. God is working. He is not passive. He's working all day. Every day, he's moving, he's praying, he, he's adjusting, he's pursuing, he, he's constantly uh, working for you, engaging in your life. Even if you don't know it, uh, even if you don't want him, uh, you cannot stop him pursuing you. And finally, sometimes these earthly dads, they're antagonistic. Antagonistic, they're, they're kind of against you. They feel threatened by you. Some, some earthly dads that think you're in a competition. They've they got to be better so they can feel better about themselves, that they want to win. But John 10.10 10 says, I came that you may have life and life more abundantly. This word abundantly in the Greek means extraordinary, over and above, more than necessary, exceeding. Our Father in heaven wants you to win. He, he wants you to have this prosperous, successful life that's reflected in who Christ is. And that's his goal. And so my dad, our earthly dad, he didn't know Christ. He's passed away now. And he just didn't know God. So I don't blame him. Um, but the trouble is, even though I've forgiven him, uh, growing up under his leadership messed me up. And a lot of my issues were daddy issues. And I, look, I love him. He didn't know any better. He wasn't a Christian. So I'm not blaming him. But I am sharing the facts that a lot of my struggles as a follower of Christ, as being a dad and a husband, come from this flawed view of my earthly dad. It's taken me decades and years to overcome and understand who God is. Um, my dad 
was absent. Never saw him. He was a workaholic. I, I, I hardly ever saw him. He was performance based. He had a list of jobs. And my parents got divorced at 13, which only sort of impacted the absence even more. And when I'd see him on the weekends, he'd have a list of jobs that I'd have to do. And I would do them. I worked hard. I think I got a lot of my work ethic from that. But it was flawed because I was trying to get significance and approval. And, and that sort of messed me up. Even as I came to Christ, I wanted to prove my worth to God. And then he was a bit passive. He just kind of wasn't... You know, I wasn't engaged. He just didn't, didn't step into my world like, like uh, my father in heaven wants to. And although I don't blame him, man, I, I've had to work hard to overcome my viewpoint of my heavenly father. Maybe today that's where you're at. And maybe you don't filter um, who the heavenly father is through scripture. You filter it through your own hurts. And, and even if we've had great dads, that, that's wonderful, but they're human. And, and, and I want to be a great dad, but I know I'm human. And so the best thing I can do for my sons and daughters is direct them to Christ, to, to the Heavenly Father, not to me, because I can't, I, I can't direct you all to me. I, I'm going to direct you all to the Heavenly Father. And I pray in this series, God will do something. That there'll be an aha moment. That there'll be a breakthrough. But by the Spirit of God, you, you, you'll be challenged in, in who you are as a son and a daughter of the Most High God, that you are loved, you, you, you are valued. And it's, it's so difficult because when I see these attributes of my dad, I wake up some days, even recently, and I think, oh my goodness, I can be absent, performance-based, and passive. How is it that we often become cats in the cradle uh, like our, our dysfunctional uh, elements of, of, of our father? This is why we've got to get this right. Not just for our sake, but so that we can lead our families and our church in, in the ways of God. I've, I've got to fight daily not to be absent, not to be performance-based, not to be passive. And I praise God for my wife who helps me uh, overcome those tendencies. Uh, today, we're going to pray that God will just impact us supernaturally. And I'm going to call on heaven right here, right now as we jump into God's Word. I pray today in Jesus' name. There would be an epiphany. There would be an, a, a, just an awakening. That there would be something deeply moving inside our spirit. That we crave for approval. We crave for acceptance. We crave to be loved. It's available. It's right here, right now, through our heavenly Father. Help us, God. Uh, through my words, that they won't be my words, but they'll be your words. That your anointing, your power, supernaturally, as we unpack Scripture, will help us uh, get this new revelation of the Father in heaven, we pray in Jesus' name. I'm going to share one story, it won't take long, but it's a beautiful story in Scripture that Jesus shared about a father. And, and this story, I think, just sort of summarizes in so many ways the attributes of this heavenly father. And it's a father that had a son who ran away. It's the prodigal son. And the father shows the character of God. And so when this, this father, his son, ran, ran away, that squandered his wealth and ruined his name and, and, and did all these things, well, we're going to look at, at the character at the heart of the father. Let's pick up the story in Luke 15, verse 20. When he got up and went to his father, so this son finally came to his senses and he goes home. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and filled with compassion for him. The father saw him a long way off. Why? The father was waiting. He was waiting. The first thought on this story is our heavenly father is a patient father. I don't know how long he'd been waiting for this son to come home. I, I, you know, the fact that he saw him coming up the driveway tells us in the story that he was watching. He was looking. He wasn't just doing his own thing. I wonder if he set up a chair on that, that porch and, uh, you know, cracked open a beer or a cider or if we're a Christian, an iced tea or whatever you want to uh, drink. And he was looking and watching. He wasn't reading. He wasn't listening to our latest leadership podcast. He was watching. 
He was watching. That, that invokes the patience of our Heavenly Father, who's constantly watching us. He's, he's constantly looking for those who are far from Him to come home. Our, our God is this, this patient. This astounds me because we are so impatient, aren't we? Now, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty laid back, but, but I can snap. I, I don't, I just, it's a DNA problem I've got. You know, I blame someone else. <laughs> I take ownership. But I'm pretty good for the most part. But every now and then, man, my patient ends. I will snap. I'm just like, who's this guy? And, and I know it's wrong, but it just makes me hard to understand. How can we have this unlimited patience? Um, I'm sure he heard bad reports about his son's living. Uh, I'm sure he didn't, um, was, wasn't happy, but notice he didn't intervene. He didn't step in and rescue. He didn't interrupt the downward spiral of his son. He didn't fix or control. He waited patiently. It's just hard for me as a parent to, to allow that to happen. Uh, but our Heavenly Father patiently waited. He, he knew he was hungry on the streets, had a bad group of friends, probably addicted, and he waited Patiently, and every day he would look out waiting, 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 waiting. You see, even though his son was going through this hard time, he didn't ignore him. He didn't forget about it. He didn't walk away. He waited patiently. Paul the Apostle, one of the greatest leaders of our modern church, in 1 Timothy 1.16 says, But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me the worst of the sinners... So Paul's kind of making a stand for his life. He's trying to give the big example of who God is. And he says, I'm the worst. I'm murdered Christians. I'm saved now. So I'm penning paper and writing two-thirds of the New Testament. And he, and he says, I was the worst of sinners. But, but here's, here's, the, here's the point I want you to know. Jesus Christ might display his what? Unlimited patience as an example for those who believe on him and receive eternal life. Our Heavenly Father, our God, our Lord has unlimited patience. 2 Peter 3, 9. God is patient with you. Praise the Lord is patient with us. We all need that patience, Brad. Come on, I thank God that he's patient with us. I love this verse. That God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone coming to repentance. This also shows the attribute of the Heavenly Father is patient for people to be saved. And as Christians, we can never lose the sight that we are on this earth to see people come to Christ, to see them change, to see them become saved. I know we're in a church, and most of you are Christians, but we can never lose the heart of the Father is to reach the sinner, the lost, who is hurting. And we want to be a church that everyone is welcome. We don't judge. We're, we're, because he is a patient Father. His patience is unlimited. I, I, I pray today that maybe God is looking down the road to you and wants you to come home. Because you can be in church, but that doesn't mean you're a Christian. You can be sitting here, but that doesn't mean you've got a relationship with God. And maybe today he's, he's looking, he's, he's wooing, he, he's waiting, he, he's, he's encouraging, inviting you to come home. Let's see what happens next. Verse 21. Then the son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I've blown it. It's over. We're done. It'll never go back to how it was. Verse 22. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his uh, finger and sandals on his feet. These are beautiful, descriptive words uh, in the Jewish culture. And we don't have time to unpack the meaning, but they're fascinating what this father did. Uh, basically, the father forgave him. Uh, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Uh, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. So they begin to celebrate. Number two, our Heavenly Father is a forgiving Father. This son sinned against his dad. He wasted his dad's money, trashed his name, uh, disgraced the family. What did the father do? Put a robe around him. What does a robe signify? It signifies a covering. He's forgiven. His, his shame is no more. Uh, he's in right standing. You know, the ring of authority that you're my son. You have the same power and authority uh, that you did when before you left. 
uh, immediately. It's instant. It's on you. That's what Jesus does when we're forgiven. We become sons and daughters. He actually remembers our sins no more. He doesn't just forgive us. They're cast away as far as the east is from the west. Psalms 103, 12. He's removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. That's just... Again, patience is hard for me to comprehend. This is impossible for me. How could you forget? How could you forget how he hurt you? How could you forget how he wronged you? How could you forget how he took advantage of you? How could you, uh, our God in heaven, forgets? He, he, he passes uh, away and remembers our sins no more. He didn't wait to see a change in behavior. He didn't give him a probationary period. Didn't make him pay back what he'd lost with interest. Didn't keep a record of wrong. In fact, he remembered the offenses no more. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he who blots out transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. I don't know any earthly father who could forget. That's just probably incomprehensible. But our heavenly father forgets. On purpose. Our Heavenly Father is a patient Father, unlimited patient. Our Heavenly Father is a forgiving Father and remembers our sins no more. And finally, our Heavenly Father is an intimate Father. Verse 20, while he was still a long way off, the Father saw him and filled with compassion for him. Compassion, he loved him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. This is so beautiful, this scripture, how it depicts his compassion and love. This was very rare for a Jewish man to run because they actually had nothing on under their robe. And so you didn't run because your robe would start flying and it's a bit unbecoming, right? And they didn't want to see the the, the white legs or something else. And so they didn't run. They just walked everywhere. So for him to run, he's saying, I don't care what people think. I, 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 my love for my son is greater than any, uh, you know, uh, approval of the elders of the town or what my servants living on my land might think. I'm running. I, I hug him. I, I kiss him. These are words of intimacy, were words of affection. He wasn't embarrassed. He didn't try to find value through his kid's success. He loved him regardless of what his kid done. 1 John 3, 1. How great is the love of our God lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that's all we are. You are a child of God. Regardless of what you do, where you've showed up here, what you've, you are, just get it in your heart today. He's crazy about you. He loves you. That's your identity. Your identity is you're a child of God if you've accepted Christ instantly. When Jesus would talk to his father, And there's no evidence that anybody used this word towards God uh, except Jesus, this word Father. Um, He would use the word Abba. This is an Aramic, um, Aramaic, one more time. Amaraic, one more time. Aramaic term for for, uh, Daddy. It's an intimate term. Our term. It's it's intimacy. It's 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 daddy. Uh, my daughter's all grown up now. She's not on the front row anymore. Oh, great one. She's still my favourite daughter. And um, the boys know that, but they're all my favourite too. But she's my favourite daughter. But she's all married up and she's doing great. And married and all this amazing son-in-law. I'm so blessed. And Josh, you're amazing. I just thank God for you. Anyway, she calls me daddy. I'm sure my son in law thinks it's just weird. But, but there is just this affection uh, that, that my daughter has towards her dad. And, you know, to call me daddy, I hope she never stops, but she may, but that's okay. And I'm just not sorry, George. I'm sorry, mate. <laughs> but there is that intimacy in that we're daddy. And I wonder if you're comfortable saying that word.
we're going to sing. I want you to sit. I want you to talk to your father through the lens of intimacy. Maybe even use the word daddy. Jesus, you lead us. I pray you feel his warmth. Come on, Holy Spirit, would you move today? I pray you feel his love.
Jesus saved me. I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. Forgive me of my sins. So I can know the Father in heaven. Hey, thank you so much for watching another message from our teaching team. We hope that it encourages you and it speaks life into your situation. Hey, while you're here, why don't you subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay connected. You can also visit our website, elevationchurch.com.au and get connected that way. Uh, remember, we will be back every single Sunday, 10, 15 a.m. So we'll see you then.